the saddest thing is to have a leader who has lost touch with themselves. If they're not in touch with themselves, then they've lost the leader that was hired in the first place. And then in my opinion, you're not fit to lead right now. So either you need to take a break, you need to go refuel and recenter and like get back to purpose. And there's a great book called Presence if you want you know, some help on that. Luckily we have a ton of tools. <laughs> this is not the first time that we're facing identity crises as a, as a world. But, but things are evolving so rapidly that we really do need to go slow to go fast. I'm wondering what's your thoughts on the current and the future of the whole personal development industry then? Because there's the powerful, the narrative around everybody being you know called and obliged almost to invest into discovering one's purpose and, and developing the right path to living a purposeful life it seems it can feel like an overwhelming you know skill of the future and almost like a competence that all of the leaders need to be investing in while many thought leaders then arrive at the truth that you've also been sharing about how it actually feels uh, deep down when you feel like you're living that purposeful life. Um, I don't know what's your, what's your thoughts on that because sometimes we feel like we are, you know, pulled into doing all these programs to discover the big th truth and, and work on ourselves. And then it's almost the circle closing itself and we're coming back to the most fundamental truths that we somehow felt at the beginning as well but it takes a long path to get there to understand i don't know if it's clear but i'm wondering what is your you know what is your feeling about where is the future of the conversation about purposeful life going and where is it most meaningful from like the truly empowering perspective so that we don't fall into another imposter you know trap of not living a meaningful and purposeful life enough Oh, this is such a good question. Oh, yes. Okay. So, and I, and I love, there's, there's, this definitely ties into the Path and Purpose podcast um, intention. If you're confused about what's Path and Purpose, check out the previous episode where we discuss Rose's journey of discovering her purpose filled with hard and salt breaking love relationships, reality shows, dropping out of school and an entire career identity. You will see how it translated into her podcast on the intersection of community, technology and Asian wisdom. So to answer specifically, what is the future of personal development? What is how do we not just keep repeating ourselves? Um, how do we close the circle? So when, when we talk about closing the circle, what immediately comes to mind is Odysseus in the Odyssey and how wild it is that in human experience, we have to leave to come back changed in order to see things in a new way. Mm. I have a mentor who I've worked with for 14 years um, in a spiritual program. And she... And I would talk often that in life, things aren't just circular. It's not that I'm just going in the same loop again and again, because I've learned lessons. And I do believe this life is filled with lessons. And until I learn the lesson, I'm going to get some assignment very similar to the last. It's going to keep asking me to grow. So instead of it being some two-dimensional circle on a plane, a it's more like a spiral. And it's more like imagining, yes, like imagining walking your life is walking around this mountain and you're walking around and you're like, huh, you look down, you realize, I feel like I've been here before, but you're a few feet above it or a half a mile above it this next time. And you're, you're ascending, bringing in Maslow's hierarchy, right? We're going through this gradual, messy, chaotic, disordered, and incredible journey of self-actualization on an individual level, me, Rose, my, you know, I'm going, I'm going, I feel like Sisyphus, 
I feel like I'm pushing a boulder up a hill and then I falls down, you know, like there are so many metaphors and we can look to philosophy. We can look to ancient storytelling mythology. There's so much there to come back to for, for meaning and sustenance. One, I think we need to be humble. There's a Leonard Cohen song that is so beautiful called Anthem. And the lyrics in that, if I can remember correctly, are basically the wars, they will be fought again. The white dove, she will be caught again, bought and sold and bought again. The something never dies. It's this is part of the Maya illusion of the learning. So trying to ascend out of difficulty, out of the messy labor of becoming a human being. If we try, and this is one of my big qualms, this is, this is the problem at the heart of path and purpose is how do we maintain humanity as we continue to evolve technologically? with artificial intelligence and robotic possibilities and bionic human beings. I have friends and people I've come close to now because they've been guests on the podcast, someone who works in brain machine interfacing, learning how our brains work and map so we can measure this activity and then be able to manipulate it and maybe control our moods and maybe control our states of mind. Then there's you know incredible people at Google developing work the possibilities for forgetting our body, for forgetting our humanity, or forgetting our, our spiritual, whatever it is for you, if you're not religious or spiritual, maybe simply that deeper self, that thing that you can't ignore, that there's life that's come before you and life that will happen after you, right? I'm going to die. I was born and I'm going to die. At least this body will. I don't know what happens to the thing that's happening, uh, animating the body. And I care in terms of the evolution of personal development. I would love to see as a human race, our ability to seize the invitation that we have right now with the racial and social justice movement with populist movements colliding against democracies and um, the desire for you know free will and control, this pandemic, the experience of the whole world facing a challenge together in a way that our lifetime we've never seen. I would love to see us embrace growing up feeling sad, feeling angry, feeling anxious, understanding why we feel those things and actually evolving to a place so we can make wise decisions for future generations. So I do think it takes messy work. Yes. I'm wondering how you bring this messy work from the individual to the collective level. I've um, obviously one of my biggest passions and curiosities is how you use the potential of the inner work for transformation of larger systems and large organizations. And um, so I'm wondering if we can speak a little bit to the power of language and how we can actually facilitate these conversations, because a lot of what you've talked about can sound very woohoo to many people listening to us. Absolutely. But if yeah. we want to have meaningful conversation, obviously we have to find a language that, that works for everybody. And so that's yep. why I find your podcast so fascinating because you're, you're marrying the, the geeky language with what can sound like spiritual language. And you've also mentioned the power of philosophy or, or Greek wisdom or whatever. So it feels like there's different modalities through which we can access the same truth. So I wonder, what do you see is the access to having these conversations about meaningful empowerment for the sake of transforming large organizations. Thank you for that. The, the question of language is so important. It brings me back to the piece that environment is more powerful than will. The ingredients, the materials we choose to build our organizations, our private companies, our public institutions, 
the ingredients and qualities we choose to build within that as the framework for cultural um, and principle organization of that collective is more powerful than one individual in there. It is, it is a collect. It's the sum of the parts. It's greater than the sum of the parts. Is that container? Um, I'm going to use a word that I think will be less woo woo, less spiritual, and it's de defined. I was listening to Bre Brene Brown's book yesterday, Dare to Lead. She's a researcher on vulnerability. And she quoted a researcher at Google. I think it's a researcher. It's someone within Google. Anyway, they were researching what creates the qualities of trust in teams to be most effective and efficient. What are the determining qualities within teams to to basically do their most innovative and effective work. The number one element necessary by far was creating an environment of psychological safety. Now, what is psychological safety? I can use spiritual terms to define that. Let's see if I can try to use some more scientific um, white collar terms here. Um, psychological safety is believing that my leadership is going to give me the necessary information I need to do my job well and to thrive. It's believing that leadership has my best intentions at heart and that there's transparency enough that we can act and do our best work and be acknowledged for that work so that the individuals within the collective are being respected, honored, appreciated, supported, empowered. The way that they feel that is through honest sharing of necessary information, of hearing from leadership when things are hard, acknowledging this is a tough situation. I'm also dealing with anxiety. I don't know what the future holds for our organization. It's sharing the hard news, honestly, then asking for feedback. So this ability to create psychological safety is necessary within our governing bodies and businesses, just as important to have at home. The same ways we build trust between spouses, between a husband and a wife or siblings or family members or best friends, these same qualities of being honest, being respectful, being reliable, caring about the other person, those same qualities have to transfer to our organizations for us to feel safe enough to do our best work, for us to feel safe enough to fail so that, and that's actually a really big one. That means that if there's some issue in the project, I'm more interested and I feel safe enough to bring that issue to the leader so that it can be addressed than to cover my behind so that I don't get fired. Because if I'm afraid and I don't feel psychologically safe or I don't feel at ease or I don't feel appreciated, I'm gonna be more interested in protecting myself than I am interested in serving and giving and generating. So a while ago, colleagues at the European institutions approached me asking me to give a speech about failure at their conference, FAIL. And I'm like, no, 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 there's no such thing as failure in my life. And this got me to research the whole subject of failure and how I understand it, what is the universe that got me to really erase this word from my vocabulary and see everything as lessons learned and dive deeper into how the others in the personal development industry see this. That's how this series was born and I hope you enjoy it. So a big question here is how do you balance the pursuit of that calling that you may feel that you came here to the organization to bring your new leadership to, you know, co-create that emotional safety with others to bring more integrity, to be the leader that you feel you came here to be in the organization. But you're hitting the wall, right? And it's painful. And that's what leadership is about. That's what pioneering is about. You're always the weird one out and the matrix tries to push you out of it, to protect itself. <laughs> How do you know when is the right time to leave 
to protect yourself first, to put your own breathing mask first? And how do you know it's still part of the heroine's journey? And that's, you know, the trials that are put in your way and you're supposed to just carry on. <clears throat> of course, that's going to be different for each person. However, the first thing that comes to mind is the word balance and self-care. If I am able to stay healthy, I can have and practice enough boundaries around me and the challenging experience at work. If I am skilled enough and I choose enough to say, okay, I'm able to define and kind of compartmentalize this is happening at work. What's happening at work isn't me. I'm going to practice keeping that in a certain set of boundaries, whether that's when I clock in and I clock out and I set it aside, or I know how to take breaks when I'm at the office. For me, the breaking point is if I have lost the ability to sleep well and get enough sleep, eat well and get enough food, drink water, tend to my important relationships and continue to do things that bring me to life. I don't, you know, if I love dancing, it doesn't mean I have to go be a professional dancer, but do I have enough time to at least dance a little bit in my life so that I can show up to work alive still? The saddest thing is to have a leader who has lost touch with themselves. If they're not in touch with themselves, then they've lost the leader that was hired in the first place. And then, in my opinion, you're not fit to lead right now. So either you need to take a break, you need to go refuel and recenter and like get back to purpose. And there's a great book called Presence if you want, you know, some help on that. Luckily, we have a ton of tools. <laughs> This is not the first time that we're facing identity crises as a, as a world. But, but things are evolving so rapidly that we really do need to go slow to go fast. So the ability to slow down and go counter culture to everything that's saying, go fast and break things, go fast and break things like we do in the United States. Oh my God, oh my God, I want to learn. I'm going to fail. I'm going to learn and fail and learn and fail and learn and fail. And then I'm like, I'm burnt out. And you're going, why are you burnt out? Because you didn't stop. We're not meant to go at, you know, 200 miles per hour nonstop. So to answer your question, if you're able to take care of yourself enough that you can stay balanced and keep learning through that challenge and bring things forward to change the system from the inside, amazing. But if you lost touch with yourself, it's time for a break or a change. It's funny because I address the same question also to... Uh... There's this uh, very high-level politician in Europe, Margaret Vestager, one of the top leaders in the European Commission, who, when I asked her about the burnout prevention advice that she would share with the um, overambitious public servants in their heart, she's like, when you burn out, you're not even serving. And so I feel it's, uh, it's almost like we shouldn't feel that taking that recovery time is stealing time away from the higher cause that we were, ser we were serving because we weren't serving it anyway, because you're not on top of your game. And so what you're saying, I feel that's a powerful reminder for people to not try to, yeah, play, pretend that this trade of personal health versus being on top of their game and serving their cause is actually functional. Um, you've tried, I wanted to ask that later, but since you've already touched upon it, what is the difference in the American and European culture when we talk about failure. Uh, because <laughs> I find that this, I mean, over here in Brussels, it's such a cliche at all the entrepreneurship conferences and obviously everybody's obsessed with how do we get the European startup culture to be more failure friendly and, 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 you know, spin fast and fail fast and whatever. Everybody's being inspired by the U American dream. But I wonder what is your um, different take uh, in view of your work through self-expression and working through various stories of failures and how we perceive them or not. Um, what is really the difference in how we look at success and failure in America and Europe? You've also lived in Europe for four years, so that's why I'm asking. Yes. Oh, goodness. It's, 
it's really fascinating. Of course, this will just be my, my perspective. Um, something that I notice, and actually my mom talks to me about this a lot, <clears throat> is if you were to imagine Europe and the United States as a persona, as a, as a being, you've got this very young nation in the US of once upon a time European settlers who took over many peoples and original land wisdom that was already there, right? You have the, the Iroquois nation of Native Americans who were living in a very different way, very different way than these settlers came and started to push through, right? And those were the pioneers and the pilgrims. And we had big ideas and ideals and we started enforcing them here. This was like 450 years ago. This was like not very long ago, right? I'm in California. I'm on the edge of the world in terms of uh, where ideas have come to be born. You know, we're sort of like seeing all the baby turtles of ideas running out to sea. Everything here is new. Everything is like young spirit. I think of us like a teenager in the United States where we are sort of like, I can rule the world. I can be anything I want to be. Don't tell me what to do. Um, and there's brilliance in that. Young people, teenagers are, are wonderful. They, they have incredible fire and incredible optimism and determination and a sense of self. And, you know, when, when you're feeling healthy, um, there can also be arrogance. There can be naivete. There can be ignorance. Um, we have not had world wars on our land here. We have not suffered going through, you know, falling of empire again and again on this soil. We have our own destruction and, and learning, but we're just, I believe, starting to deal with the suffering that took place both through our, our slave era and trampling the Native American way of life that was here that had so much wisdom to it and was not built on the same levels of enormous hierarchy and empire mindset, right? But here in the United States, I think of it a little bit more as the Wild West and the young teenager spirit. So yes, go fast and break things. Once you go fast, break things, and learn your life's lesson, it might make for a great TED Talk. In the next part of this series, Rose shares her experience of coaching TED speakers and where the world's business leaders should be sharing more openly about their failures. So don't forget to subscribe to follow this channel, not to miss the next episode. We are. We are going fast and we are breaking things. And yes, there are people who are profiting from that right now. And it can be very flashy and very seductive. I also believe it's very short-sighted. There are, there are things that, you know, that Europe can look to the United States and learn from both about being agile and spirited and optimistic and playful. I love that about us. I love that. I missed that when I was in Paris. I miss seeing people smile and come up with big ideas and be silly and trust innocence, right? Then you go over to Europe and we have this like probably been married once or twice kind of older, older man, older woman, you choose, but they've been around the block. You know, you've had multiple world wars on your soil. You coexist with many other nations. There's a maturity and a caution that has taken place in Europe very understandably. And frankly, that, that has the benefit uh, and elegance of refinement and tradition and story and talk about education system. I mean, there are things that exist in Europe that have evolved counter to just go fail. It's like, why reinvent the freaking wheel, you know? we know how this works, let's actually use some systems and not try to constantly go outside of the box because you've been burned over there by going outside the box too much. So there have been necessary structures to keep things in place. So I have respect for the wisdom both in Europe and the United States. And there's a shadow both in Europe of staying stuck and still a little bit more in that masculine patriarchal dominance mindset of, you know, there, there are old staid systems there. So those are my ideas of these two different personas, the teenager and the like 
married a couple of times, <laughs> older, lived it, been there, done that. And, and maybe they didn't even get married a couple of times. Maybe they just had a couple of affairs and they stayed married because you don't really want the neighbors to talk. You know, you choose. This is calling for a very politically incorrect joke <laughs> with all my love <laughs> for friends. <laughs> Wondering whether this assessment, you know, is built on your experience of France or of Europe. <laughs> So how did you enjoy it? I'm wondering, how is your journey of discovering your life purpose? And most of all, what would have been helpful when you were starting your inner work in discovering the values, the principles driving the work? And what do you think could be the principles that can help the others who are on this journey to show up from a much more comfortable, authentic and values-based leadership space? Let me know in the comments underneath the interview. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so that you're totally up to date whenever there's new episodes released. Thank you and see you next time.